All right, everybody. So we have Dr. Gabrielle Fundaro back with us today. She is on her way to becoming an RD, and she already has her PhD, and I want to get this right, in human nutrition, foods, and exercise from Virginia Tech in the area of gut microbiome and human metabolism, right? Yes, yes. Great job. <laughs> so welcome back. Thank you. Uh, and so we started talking a few months ago, actually. Um, I was talking to you about the carnivore diet and how it's interesting that that's getting pretty popular. Um, I just released a podcast with Dr. Sean Baker, and I think he's one of the biggest proponents of it now, making it really popular. He was on Joe Rogan, Mark Bell's podcast. So he's become pretty prolific with it. Um, and not everybody agrees with him, of course. And, and I think there's some points that you definitely don't agree with him on and the carnivore diet in general. So, you know, we can talk a little bit more generally and then we'll get more specific. Um, but generally, what are your thoughts on this, this new fad? Um, well, <laughs> you put it correctly that it's a fad. Um, that unfortunately, I think people are conflating the results that one person has seen or a few people have seen um, with evidence that this is an effective long-term treatment for uh, a variety of uh, either autoimmune diseases or inflammatory bowel diseases or even irritable bowel syndrome. And in fact, it's just that coincidentally, the people who are following the carnivore diet may have removed an item or items from their diet that were causing some gastric distress. And so they see an improvement there and then apply that to mean that the benefit is coming from only eat, me, eating meat rather than the benefit being from avoiding whatever it was they weren't digesting well. So I don't have anything against a short-term elimination diet specifically. Um, the low FODMAP diet is something that I use with plenty of clients to, to, to and see great success with that. But the purpose is not to put them on a low FODMAP diet indefinitely. It's to initiate them with a, a two to three week uh, phase of, you know, really kind of restrictive elimination where we're drastically reducing the overall um, load of those fermentable carbohydrates and then systematically and gradually reintroducing foods so we can determine their level of tolerance. Um, and, I, and I don't mean that in terms of immune system, but just in terms of digestive ability to each one of those groups of FODMAPs. And then we move back toward having a diet that's high in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, fiber, um, really the, the, the you know, key um, food stuffs that we generally recommend in part of a nutritious diet that supports overall health, function, and longevity. So um, I find it really problematic, too, that there are practitioners um, who have sworn to do no harm that are recommending this diet that, although the relative risk of increased colorectal cancer may be low, it is still uh, higher than what we see with people who have uh, a less frequent intake of red meat or processed meat. So yes, I, I do agree that, you know, the relative risk is fairly low, that an individual's risk of developing colorectal cancer at any point is fairly low. And if we eat red meat with great frequency, it's only a small increase, about every, anywhere from 17 to upwards of 60%. But even that increase still needs to be recognized as an increase. Just like any any you know behavior that we may partake in that may only have a small you know relative risk, and I've brought this up before when people are you know really concerned about using, for example, birth control, um, and and you know looking at the risk of increased inflammatory bowel diseases. The relative risk is very low, but it's still important to point that out that there is a relative risk increase there, and that if you have perhaps a genetic predisposition to one of those inflammatory bowel diseases, it may be a contraindication and you may want to look for, you know, an alternative route. So I think it's the same thing when we're looking at, um, you know, the, the carnivore diet, that now we're taking it to absolute extremes. It's not just that you're having an increased intake of red meat, but now your diet is 100% animal flesh. And, and, and you are now removing many of the beneficial uh, other nutrients that you would get from eating plant material. So that's really where I, I see, a, um, you know, I, I think it's a, that's one, of, one valid point of contention in my opinion that, you know, we really need to be, I think, more transparent and more realistic about what the risks may actually be and what the long-term implications would be. 
Right. And I think, and I'm not saying this reasoning is accurate, just playing devil's advocate here. I think his argument there is, you know, if you take something like inflammatory bowel disease and in those patients, they have something like four to five times the risk of um, colon cancer. Right. So you're talking 400, 500 percent. So in his argument, I think, is that if you can then maybe not, you know, you're obviously not curing IBD, but the source of the or like the way that cancer is more likely Um, in those patients because of all the inflammation. And so if you can bring down that inflammation through this diet, then maybe there's that 17 to 60% increase with the high meat intake. But, you know, with the dramatically reduced inflammation, you know, there's going to be a net benefit. Now, again, I'm not saying that that's necessarily correct. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, it would be great if we actually had the evidence to back that statement up. Mm -hmm. Um, theoretically, perhaps if we say that, oh, because a person has, you know, uh, fewer symptoms, inflammation must be reduced, but we need to have the clinical evidence, the data so that long-term following a carnivore diet does lead to measurable reductions in inflammatory markers and to developing cancer down the line. Um, you know, we, the, 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 Obviously, you know, an individual's um, comfort and quality of life are absolutely paramount. And if they're having, you know, reduced symptoms, that's excellent. But I don't think we need to just stop there and say, okay, now you're going to have a carnivore diet for the rest of your life uh, because we know that there are inherent risks. But how about we look at ways that we can then improve the nutrient density of your diet, improve the variability of your diet, and ensure that we aren't, you know, causing significant changes to the microbiome um, and without, you know, perhaps adding a little bit of a, a safety net there. Because we do know that, you know, in, in, in ketogenic style diets, which can be very low in fiber, they're generally very high in fat and can be higher in animal products. Um, if those are devoid of fiber, we do see the loss of beneficial microbes. But by adding a resistant starch to that diet, so that can be found in really green bananas and uh, starches that have been cooked and cooled repeatedly, that we actually can reduce some of that loss of, of biodiversity. So that would be you know, a potentially very easy fix. What about if we start with just some sources of resistant starch? And then can we increase the overall fiber content of the diet? Can we increase the variability of the diet and still maintain their quality of life and their comfort and reduce, um, you know, exacerbations? So I'm I'm wondering when we talk about reducing the beneficial bacteria here, I think there's probably not a ton of data long term on the gut microbiome on a ketogenic diet. So is it that we're looking at, okay? In the general population, we see a correlation with this bacteria to be beneficial, and that same bacteria is reduced in a ketogenic diet, but we don't necessarily know if in that ketogenic state, it's a negative that that's happening. Would that be accurate? Yeah. In uh, what we're looking at in humans and in rodents is usually a four to six week duration of that diet. Um, Now, we haven't really been able to measure changes in the thickness of the mucus layer in the colons of of humans, uh, but in mice, we have measured a a reduction in the thickness of that mucus layer. So in the colon, uh, ideally we have actually a a bilayer of mucus. So we have a top layer that is permeable to bacteria and then a a lower layer that should be impermeable to bacteria. Um, And that is part of what, that's that's sort of one of the first lines of immune defense is that we can actually just trap pathogens and things that might want to pass through uh, it, through, between those those colonocytes. And so we really want to maintain a nice thick uh, mucus layer. Now, in terms of what beneficial bacteria are usually reduced, it's quite often bifidobacteria, and those are really one of the, the prime groups of butyrate producers. And butyrate mm-hmm. has been linked to improved insulin sensitivity, appetite regulation, um, enhanced tight tight junction proteins. And um, that's another thing that has been shown to be reduced in a, in a high fat, um, lower carbohydrate, low fiber diet that that's been implicated also in the reduction of those tight junction proteins. Um, so all of those together, I think from, you know, both the human and the mouse data, and we have just, you know, uh, we have randomized control trials in mice, uh, a fair number of those. We can't obviously extrapolate all of those to humans, but we do see some of the same manifestations in humans as well, such as a loss of fecal butyrate. Um, so I, I just think that at this point, the, the 
evidence for supporting the benefits of a, of a diet that includes plants is mm -hmm. much greater than the evidence for the benefit of a diet that is completely free of plant matter. Yeah, and I think, like you said, most of the evidence shows that people who eat more fruits and vegetables have better health in general. Um, some will argue, I think, that, you know, vegetables, even from like an evolutionary standpoint, they don't necessarily, I mean, sometimes they want to be eaten so that the seeds can be spread, but they have these mechanisms so that they can't necessarily be digested. And so there's these different chemical compounds in plants that will cause issues. And by having a carnivore diet, you're eliminating those. So what would you say to that? Um, yes, it's true that plants do contain some anti-nutrients. And then if we don't process those plants properly, we reduce the bioavailability and the digestibility of those plants. But if you are soaking them and cooking them and you're beginning sort of the process of breaking down some of those fibers um, and it just an and overall reduction of the content of those anti-nutrients, there's no evidence that they are actually, you know, going to be problematic in terms of in normal amounts inhibiting the absorption of nutrients. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, I have seen some case studies where people are subsisting, you know, just almost entirely on lentils mm -hmm. um, and then and they do run into micronutrient deficiencies, uh, perhaps because the lentils, you know, that the, the uh, phytonutrients there and things like that are, are, are inhibiting uh, absorption and also just because your diet only contains one food and that alone can be problematic. Right. Um, so, you know, at the it's, it's just like any other extreme, there are going to be issues if we take it to extremes. But if you're eating a varied diet and you're getting your sources of nutrients from a variety of plants and I think also um, animal food should be included. I'm really probably, if I'm going to be dogmatic about something, it's that I think most people probably should be omnivorous um, mm -hmm. or at least a little bit, you know, lacto-ovo-vegetarian. There's, there's great benefit in consuming um, animal products. I just don't agree with the extremes of, of, you know, not having any plant matter at all in your diet. Um, now, in terms of, you know, evolutionarily speaking, I've heard some people say things like, you know, we're not meant to digest plants. We have the digestive tract of a carnivore. We have the teeth of a carnivore. Um, and that really is also very inaccurate. Um, when you look at the digestive system of a true carnivore, it's much simpler than ours is. Likewise, if you look at the digestive tract of a, of a true herbivore, it's much more complex than ours is. So we are, you know, are, are from, and, and we also have to consider the, the role of the microbiome. All animals contain at least one microbiome. Now we have the, you know, microbiomes on our skin, oral microbiome, intestinal microbiome, and they fill the, the roles where we um, lack the digestive capabilities of breaking things down. So yes, it's true that humans lack the digestive enzymes to break down uh, many types of carbohydrates. And that's why we've co-evolved with these microbes because they can do that for us. They can ferment those fibers and produce short chain fatty acids, which we then can utilize. And it's the same thing when we look at ruminant animals and even carnivores, they're going to have a microbiome as well. Those microbiota, those, those microorganisms specifically fill those niches. And we can see that even in humans who have a vegan diet versus an animal-based diet, they have different microbial colonies because they're filling different niches. They're responding to the nutrients that are available. So when you look at the gastrointestinal tract of a human, you know, not only do we have, as you know, we have mixed dentature, so we can break, you know, we can, we can uh, masticate, we can break down, you know, animal sources or plant sources of food. When we get to the stomach, yes, it's an extremely acidic pH. And to be true, we don't have, we don't see carbohydrate digestion occurring in the stomach. So the salivary amylase that we, that some of us express to start breaking down carbohydrates is denatured in the stomach. But then once we get to the small intestine, we do produce, uh, as humans, produce digestive enzymes to break down some carbohydrates. The indigestible carbohydrates then pass to our colon and that's where they're fermented. So humans are colon fermenters and so are other omnivores. Like we see that there are some rodents that are colon fermenters as well. A true herbivore may have a really complex multi-chambered stomach. They may have, um, we, we, they may be foregut fermenters. So they have sort of a chamber even before their stomach that's a source of fermentation. Um, if we look at a true carnivore, they don't have those things and their digestive tracts are even simpler than ours are and they may not even have a cecum at all. 
In mm -hmm. humans, we do have a cecum. So that's where the small intestine meets the large intestine, and it's a site for fermentation and bacterial proliferation. So to say that we look like a carnivore is false. To say that we look like an herbivore is false. We truly do look like omnivores because we have the digestive capabilities for proteins and for carbohydrates. We have the enzymes for to break both of those down. We do lack some of those enzymes, but then again, we've co-evolved with the microbes that help us break those things down. And so we are um, a really unique and complex organism with this internal ecosystem that sort of fills in the gaps for us. And so even from an evolutionary standpoint, it makes sense to say that we can we can live on a, an omnivorous diet, we can live on a carnivorous, di a carnivorous diet or um, an herbivorous diet, that's mm -hmm. probably part of the reason why we are, um, you know, sort of the, the apex predator to, that we are today and that we can adapt to really any situation. Um, but is that, does that mean that it's ideal? Does that mean that it is, um, you know, the best choice that we can make for human health and longevity? Not necessarily, but I just don't think that that's a valid argument to say that, you know, we're carnivores because of our digestive tracts. That's really not the case. Right. And, and I think you make a good point about there's nothing wrong with trying different diets. I mean, I think now you brought it to light and other people about how the FODMAP diet, it's not meant to be long term. But for a lot of time, like people were thinking this is just what you do forever. Mm -hmm. um, and I mentioned last time specific carbohydrate diet. It's very popular in like the in IBD patients. And there are a few small studies showing that it is beneficial. But if you talk to people who have done it, a lot of time, you know, they have an illegal and illegal list of foods. Right. And you'll find people say, well, I, I don't tolerate this, that and the other legal food or I've actually tried some of these illegal foods and I'm OK. And so as much as I'm a proponent of the diet, and I do think it helps people. It's really just an elimination diet. You start with a few base foods that you think you're OK with and you slowly add back and you see. And like some people will talk about how and I think um, Dr. Michael Ruscio, who I had on, agreed with this, that it probably doesn't take months to see if you tolerate a food. You know, some people will say, well, you had this reaction two months later because of a food you had. I think you're probably going to know within a few days whether or not you tolerate a food. So um, and we also talked about this last time, how I very slowly introduced foods when I was having some GI issues. Um, and it's a pain in the butt, <laughs> but, yeah. you know, you will find out, OK, I'm OK with this or I'm not. And eventually, hopefully you are adding a wide variety of foods. Exactly. Yeah, I, that's my number one. And it's not just that, you know, even just from a health standpoint, you know, it's great to have a varied diet, but just from a, a quality of life and even a social standpoint, it's so often that I see clients who are becoming really fearful and anxious about their food, that they don't feel that they can go out with their friends, that they don't want to go to social functions because they don't know what they can eat, that they no longer enjoy cooking. And, and, and that's such an important part of our life. I mean, eating is something that we need to feel comfortable doing multiple times a day, just like using the restroom, you know? Mm -hmm. So I want to help people get to a place where they feel that they are empowered with the knowledge of what they can eat and then things that they want to limit. Not a, not a place of fear and restriction and anxiety, but just that, oh, I know that I don't handle, you know, like onions very well. Um, it would be a, a shame to go through life thinking that you can't eat anything when really it was just maybe one or two foods that were causing gastric distress mm -hmm. and that you can very easily, you know, avoid those and still have a, a, a healthy and um, abundant, you know, relationship with food and, 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 and social events. Right. And uh, not to go into a huge rant, as I already made a whole video on it, but we talked a little bit before about the IgG food sensitivity tests. Yes. And they're not the only food sensitivity tests. There are other types out there. But generally speaking, in addition to, you know, people getting completely different results when sending in one after another, like for the blood work, um, they just they eliminate so many foods that I think you can cause more issues that, yeah, you probably did if you took away 40 foods. You probably took away something that was causing you a problem if you were somebody who was having problems. But it's not a very scientific way to go about it, in my opinion. And these people just think, well, I just can't eat this forever. And there's, a, I mean, taking away like half the foods that they used to eat, you know, I think that can cause a lot of nutritional issues down the road. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then un I almost, almost unfortunately, you know, when you are reducing, when you significantly reduce a person's food choice, especially if the foods they eat habitually, um, 
you may a you may indeed remove the food that they were reacting to and that's a good thing but mm -hmm. it can be bad because now they've kind of misapplied that oh this test worked right b they may lose weight because of caloric restriction just because they have less food choice and you don't know what to eat now if that was part of their goal oh that's good i mean it's good in a way you know but at the same time now they may have misapplied that oh i, I wasn't tolerating that food well and so it was preventing fat loss and then I switched to this diet and now I've seen success and I've seen results and um, it's just sort of applying correlation or excuse me applying causation where there's really just correlation right. uh, and I and I have seen you know I have seen even and I, I, I really wasn't surprised but you know there are practitioners that are still talking about like food combining you know you can't yeah. eat foods together I mean it's just stuff that is I, I think, you know, because some of us is, we, we, we hang out with sort of the same types of practitioners. And so mm -hmm. it's very, very rare that I hear that because the, the group of people that I rub elbows with a lot, you know, we don't right. spread that type of misinformation. And then to see this, you know, in a printout, um, it was, it, it just blows my mind that, you know, people will still think that. And, um, and unfortunately, you know, clients trust them because they're yeah. practitioners and, um, yeah, so so that is that's really it's frustrating. Obviously, that strikes a nerve with me. <laughs> yeah, well, I was just talking to Lyle McDonald yesterday, and obviously, a controversial figure in this industry. Uh -huh. um, but I will give him credit that usually what he says is very backed up by a lot of science. Mm -hmm. And we were saying how, just like you said, we kind of are in almost an echo chamber of our own, right? Because yeah. we are surrounded by people who kind of think like us and are evidence based. And so, what I was telling him was that. I don't remember who I was talking to, just like a friend of mine who was kind of in fitness, but like in their own fitness world. And they hadn't heard of Lyle McDonald or Elaine Norton. And to me, I'm like, how can you be in fitness and not know them? But that's just because that's what I've been around for 15 yeah. years. You know, um, I think I tend to forget sometimes that the majority of people who are in fitness, it's Instagram culture. It's maybe CrossFit. It, it's just like different than what we are used to. And so we forget how prolific some of these ideas are that are potentially harmful for other people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that one thing I've seen the growth of, and I'm happy to see this, is is that there are more practitioners, more trainers um, who are putting out content for people who are very new to the field. Because some of what we put out, because we're so familiar with it, it's really advanced and it sort mm -hmm. of leaves people behind. And, and the folks that probably need to have, you know, more guidance and really, really good evidence-based information are the people who are really new to the industry because they aren't familiar with, you know, the practitioners who are evidence-based versus those who are just making things up and trying to sell stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. I had, um, there was a person, I, I, I posted uh, one of those stupid food sensitivity tests and I was like, this is just fake bullshit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a person respond to me and say, oh, it's a sponsored ad. That's my litmus test. That's my layman's litmus test. If something's a sponsored ad, then mm -hmm. I know I probably shouldn't listen to that. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's such a great idea. You know, so little things like that, like, is this person trying to sell you something? Is this a sponsored ad? Um, you know, looking out for those things because some of these tests, you know, some of them say like IgG food sensitivity tests, but I've seen others like MRT leap tests. Um, and even people who have a science background in some cases will promote those, but uh, those aren't backed either. So, so it's like, it's, it's so hard for people who even are in the field to know, mm -hmm. you know, to kind of sniff things out. But people who are brand new to it, I mean, those are the ones that we really, I think, should be reaching out to and making sure that we're not leaving them behind because we're like looking at all these advanced techniques and have forgotten about the foundations. Yeah, it is tough. I mean, like you said, even for me doing this for so long, you know, I'm not like you have a PhD in this, right? So like, unquestionably, you're going to know more than I do, even if it's something that I've kind of casually read about for 15 years, right? And thankfully, I have people like you, I can talk to if there's something that I'm not sure of. But a lot of these people, I mean, their best source of information is the jack guy at the gym, or the girl with a nice butt or, you know, whatever. And it <laughs> it is understandable that they get a lot of misinformation, because Frankly, most people don't want to do all that research and look into it, nor do they have the time necessarily. Yeah. So it is yeah. tough. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. a. It takes so much time. I mean, you know, the, and this is part of the reason why I get frustrated, you know, specifically with gut health things is that, um, you know, maybe maybe it's some underlying jealousy. How can you be so sure about what you're saying? And I'm not sure about it. I'm like, I've said this. <laughs> right. Um, 
but it's so complex. And I say this all the time that like the level of nuance is just insane. You like everything, everything is context dependent. And this is an entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if some with one biologist came out and said, Hey, I know how to solve the problem of like, you know, all the deforestation, like I can save literally every rainforest, I know how to do it. It's just this one protocol, and it'll every rainforest will be saved by this. Most people would be like, are you sure? Like you're just a <laughs> biologist, you know, like people, yeah. there's people that disagree with, you know, climate change um, scientists because it's a, oh, only 97% or whatever. But it's like, that is, that's the equivalent of someone saying like, oh, I have the cure. I have the solution to all of your gut problems. Mm -hmm. It's, it is an entire ecosystem and we right. still, you know, and, and it's, and they're almost even sub ecosystems because what we see in the lumen of the small intestine is significantly different from what we see in the mucus layer of the colon. So it's like, you know, I, I really try to stress that like when I'm trying to help people, I'm trying to mitigate their digestive discomfort and recommend things that, you know, we have at least a little bit of evidence to say this might help, but it might not, you know, right. I mean, because there's only so much we can do. And it really is about, you know, managing distress and discomfort, not that I'm going to like rebuild your entire microbiome. There's no way that I can justify saying that. Right, right. What do you think about the concept some people talk about where these elimination diets, because they reduce the diversity of the microbiome, and then you take a probiotic with beneficial bacteria to, in theory, populate the microbiome with those beneficial bacteria? Um, I mean, again, I just don't think that we've got a couple really compelling studies uh, that are pretty invasive. Uh, one that I've talked about before was that when we look at people whose microbiomes have been uh, significantly, their diversity has been significantly reduced due to antibiotics. When they took a lactobacilli containing probiotic, there was a delay in the reestablishment of the native biome from before that, that administration of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And so even though that was an abundance of beneficial bacteria, it could still be considered a form of dysbiosis in terms of just low bacterial number and low diversity. So right. that could be a potential effect. Um, if you are you know, trying to use it, an elimination diet to, you know, really reduce the diversity of the gut. Well, we don't know because diversity even, even itself is sort of a, um, a, a dynamic construct, but you could have a, a change in diversity, not necessarily a reduction or an increase in diversity, but a change in diversity in terms of the relative abundance of different species. So in many cases, uh, species of bacteria will compete with each other for nutrients, um, for real estate. And so if you have a reduction in one group, you may have then an increase in another group. So now, even though the overall diversity, you know, the number of, of actual organisms may not change, but like a teeter-totter, one goes down and one comes up. So we don't know if we're going to, you know, really reduce like the overall bacterial load or how reducing one group might influence the numbers of another group. So that's the caveat to that. Now, if we do indeed reduce numbers of specific bacteria, there's really no way for us to control what we're going to reduce. We may reduce some of the beneficial and some of the pathogenic or like a couple of studies that have, have come out recently. We have some um, opportunistic pathogens that may be kind of bad, but they're preventing the growth of ones that are really, really bad. And so mm -hmm. if we reduce those kind of bad guys, then we might get an overgrowth of the really bad guys. And we don't mm -hmm. want that to happen either. So that's why it's so context dependent that we're looking at relative abundances and that there are a lot of relationships that we just don't understand yet. Because in addition to that, in addition to those microbes communicating with each other, they communicate with our own immune system. Um, so they can actually uh, influence the, the expression of, of immune cells and of um, 
sort of identification markers on our cells, like our colonocytes, and our immune system will also be able to suppress the growth of specific bacteria as well. So there's so much communication going on there that, again, I don't think we can say like, oh, yes, this elimination diet will completely revamp your whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But I think there is evidence to say that some of these elimination diets have been shown to consistently reduce numbers of bacteria that we know to be beneficial in both humans and in mice. So, you know, it's, it's sort of, I think we can make some statements about certain things, but then, you know, as a whole, like the entire ecosystem, um, I actually, I, I appreciated that, you know, Dr. Russia said that we can nudge the ecosystem. Um, I think that that's probably the most accurate statement that we may be able to, you know, on the fringes, we can influence some taxa. Can mm -hmm. we renew the entire thing? Can we slash and burn and grow a new one? Probably not, um, unless we're looking at, you know, really, really, like, really big doses of, of broad spectrum antibi antibiotics that we take for a long time, or if we're infected with a pathogen that is so virulent that causes, you know, mass destruction um, of, of multiple taxa. But aside from that, when we're looking at just like, you know, generally healthy people who may have some GI distress and like want to change things with diet, probably very limited in what we can do there. What did you think of his comments regarding like the three different types of probiotics, how a lot of times people will try to take the same or they'll try different brands, but it's actually the same class of probiotics each time. So they haven't tried, I guess, like different spectrums of them. Yeah, I, I did agree with that. Where I had some disagreement was um, in his statement about being, you know, not evidence limited. So mm -hmm. that, you know, in case, so some, in some cases we don't have evidence that the bacteria is going to be, you know, beneficial or the probiotic will be beneficial in, in one instance, but it might be. And I would say to that, that true, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. But in some cases, we do have evidence of an absence of an effect. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I think it's really important that we do look back at those systematic analyses and, and even, you know, and Cochrane interviews and things that are, are really, you know, high on the level of, of evidence, uh, of the hierarchy of evidence. And from there, we can say, okay, it's co pretty consistent that, you know, X probiotic does not really help with constipation. So mm -hmm. probably don't start with, you know, the kitchen sink probiotic or whatever, any general probiotic in someone that has constipation. It's probably most efficient to go there and say, this one does seem to be effective for constipation. Um, once we've ruled out that, you know, the dietary interventions aren't really helping, maybe this is a next step. You don't want to live on supplements forever. The chance of this being extremely effective is pretty low. But if it's something that you feel is a worthwhile investment in terms of money and time, sure, go ahead and try this. In cases where we don't have evidence to say that something will work or not, I think it's a fair statement that yes, we need to try it and see if it's going to work. Um, but at the same time, we can't make the statement that this might work or would probably work. We have to say, I don't know if this is going to work. There's absolutely no evidence to say one way or the other whether this is going to work. And I don't think that that should be your first step then. If you don't have the evidence to support it, you probably have evidence for something else that you really need to try first. Uh, but I do agree that, yeah, a lot of people, especially are just taking, um, you know, kind of like I call them the kitchen sink probiotics. So it's just a, a mixture usually of, you know, he, he, he mentioned the lacto bifido blends. Mm -hmm. um, so those are really common. You know, the soil based um, probiotics that are that are coming out now, like the spore forming, um, which are usually bacillus. Those are really those are really popular right now. Again, we don't have you know really strong evidence that they're going to be beneficial across the board. It's just something that's become very popular right now. Uh, so we have to be, I think, more selective about using the evidence that we have to apply the, that specific strain effect to a specific um, pathology. You know, we, there, there's good evidence that some are beneficial for a few things, mm -hmm. but we also have to be very transparent about, you know, the fact that there's evidence that shows that they're not beneficial for another handful of things. Like they don't improve sport performance. They don't help with weight loss. Um, you know, so, so being more transparent and being more specific about our recommendations with those and our expectations. Um, you know, we, we don't see a lot of benefit, for example, with constipation. This is what I see pretty often. Um, you know, if you have increased transit time of 15 hours, excuse me, decreased transit time of 15 hours, 
oh, I mean, that might be worth it for some people, but is that really going to be enough to, to justify spending, you know, perhaps $60 a month if that's right. really the, the only potential benefit? Do you think we're going to see any major advancements? I mean, I'm sure when it comes to the microbiome in general, we're going to see a ton because, and I've said before, you kind of got into this at like the perfect time because there's so much interest in it now. Um, so I'm sure we're going to see some pretty major advancements in general. But in terms of probiotic supplementation, do you think we're going to have any, you know, like massive waves with that? Because I mean, I've tried, you know, I've tried BSL-3, which is pretty much like the only prescription probiotic. Yeah. Um, I've made my own yogurt from like a starter and all this. Um, I've never really noticed anything from it. And a lot of people seem to not really notice anything. So I, I don't know if I've heard many stories of somebody saying like, I took this and it just helped so much. It was just dramatic difference, you know? Right. Right. Um, I think probably the next step won't be so much the, the probiotic supplementation, although I'm sure we'll see, because what happens is we get sort of a golden child, um, microbe every once in a while. Um, I think the, the one that I've heard of recently, which is, is sort of a reemergences. Um, I think it's pronounced, I think it's Kristen. Christinella or something or Kristen Sella, I can't remember, but um, it was one that was, you know, I identified in the um, uh, microbiomes of, of lean people or was deficient mm -hmm. in people who had obesity. And so that's like a golden child. I've had people ask me about that. Like, is this, you know, going to be the next probiotic? I'm mean, well, probably because, you know, someone pointed it out right. um, or, or um, um, the one that I just posted yesterday, M Shade Larry, it's a microbe that like we didn't even know existed really in the human gut because it doesn't um, it, it doesn't exist it doesn't survive well in fecal samples. Um, it usually hangs out in the mucus layer, um, mm -hmm. but it seems to confer some protection against um, salmonella infections. And there are others we've we've looked at in mice that help protect against um, uh, pathogenic strains of E. coli. So you know we can pick these like super cool looking microbes and say like oh take this one. Um, but that M shade Larry actually also may drive colitis inflammation. So, oh, wow. you know, yeah. Perfect. So again, <laughs> context dependent. like you may not want to take that if, um, so I don't think that we'll, we'll see, you know, I don't think they're going to go away, but I think probably the next, um, wave of, of interventions and supplements would probably be with the fecal microbiome transplant with FMT, um, that has been used for a while in people with C. diff, and it's really an effective treatment in people with C. diff. Doesn't appear to be quite as effective for um, other things like IBS, um, but you know that's still an emerging um, intervention. And then there was just I, I was sent this um, recent publication um, on FMT in individuals with autism. Um, mm -hmm. So they received an FMT and then were followed for two years. Uh, but the issue with that is that there was no control group. So yeah, we like, yeah, we, like it, yeah, it could have been just that two years had elapsed and, you know, symptoms subsided just as, as in, you know, as a time effect. Um, so, but, but it's something that we've used, you know, in rodent studies for, for many, many years now as a way to uh, induce phenotypic changes associated with the disease. So we'll take a, a either a germ-free mouse or a, a notobiotic mouse that has specific strains um, that we on, only that we want. They may be humanized. And then we do a, an FMT and then, you know, we can um, induce obesity in a lean mouse either through increased energy harvesting or increased food intake we can induce um, inflammatory bowel disease symptoms, and we can even induce behavioral changes. Now, those behavioral changes are not consistent every time. It's not that, you know, if you give a mouse the, the feces of a mouse that you consider to be having, a, um, have, have anxiety, that that next mouse then acts, you know, more anxious all the time. Um, and we especially see that if we do human to mouse transplants, that we don't see always a consistent, um, representation of the, you know, pathology that we saw in, in the human. Um, so I, I just, but I think that that's probably, you know, our next step is that we can, if we know that we can extract these microbes and make them, you know, put them in a deliverable pill form um, and that it's very effective for treating some things. Uh, but again, I think that, you know, it'll, it'll have its limitations just like probiotic supplementation does. We still have to look at the, the risks and, and the benefits because if you're, you know, taking on a, another uh, microbiome, then there are going to be, you know, potential pathogens in that as well. 
So um, speaking of supplements in general, we talked before about obviously the acidity of the stomach. And I've seen some people in recent years talk about betaine HCL and they'll say that, you know, because you would think that it's just going to make everything more acidic. So that might cause more acid reflux. These proponents of it argue that because the stomach is now more acidic, you'll digest the food better and therefore not have reflux. And, you know, you can go on Amazon and look up any of these supplements and they have hundreds of reviews of people saying it cured their acid reflux. Um, you hear something similar with digestive enzymes. So this is really contradictory compared to what's taught in, you know, like medical school where you might have like a meprazole, a PPI prescribed to you if you have acid reflux. Um, so what are your thoughts there? Um, well, when we are looking at pH, there really are, a, there's a reason why we have a protective mucus layer, both in the stomach and the intestines. So, um, stomach contents, our digestive juices there have a pH of about one to two. I mean, extremely, extremely acidic. So taking a digestive enzyme, that's not going to be more acidic than the pH of the stomach. If it were, it would cause it would have a, an extremely caustic effect. You wouldn't be able to touch it. Um, if anyone has ever been around hydrochloric acid, it's something that I worked with um, when I was in grad school. Like you can't even crack the bottle open too close to your face because just the smell is so accurate and so caustic. Um, now with digestive enzymes, just like any protein, they're very sensitive to pH. And so they'll have a specific pH range at which they function properly. That's why the pH of the body is so tightly controlled. The pH of the stomach and of the lumen of the small and large intestine, very different from each other and then also from what we see in the body and what we see in the oral cavity. So as part of um, my, my collab with Miguel from Revive Stronger, we're writing about greens powders and I've been looking into um, the efficacy of digestive enzymes. And one thing that really struck me that um, I wasn't, but I wasn't surprised to see that in most cases, um, those digestive enzymes have a pH range of activity between about four to seven. And so that means once they hit the stomach acid with a pH of one to two, they're denatured mm -hmm. or sort of pulled apart and digested just like the rest of our dietary proteins. So they're not going to be active outside of the mouth. Now say that perhaps they have an enteric coating and so they're able to survive quote unquote transit out of the stomach. Then that means when they hit the small intestine, well, the duodenum still has a pH of about two, maybe three. And so we actually don't see the same pH that we'll see in the mouth um, in the areas of the small intestine where we have digestion and absorption occurring. So they really are not going to be functional digestive enzymes um, outside of our oral cavity. Now there is some evidence that specific uh, digestive enzymes that are pharmaceutical grade in really, really high doses may help with digestive discomfort in people who have exocrine pancreatic inefficiency. Um, so those are things like really high doses of lipase, but even those are denatured up to about 90% in the stomach. So you can be damn sure that whatever you're getting on, you know, online or over the counter, um, that stuff is not going to be dosed as high as the pharmaceutical grade. Um, we don't have, you know, obviously because it's not regulated, we don't know about the purity. Um, they're not going to be tested for efficacy and they're not going to make your stomach any more acidic than it already is. It is already extremely acidic. So um, those things I think are, are just really a huge waste of time for what we're taking over the counter. Um, now there have been a couple uh, studies done on um, lactase enzyme. And again, um, it was really, really large doses. I wanna say like 6,000 IUs or something and people could tolerate a small amount of dairy. But most people can tolerate up to about 150 mils of dairy anyway, even if they are lactose intolerant. Um, because the lactase production is a sliding scale. It's not that it's just on or off. Some people may produce more or less. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some evidence that, uh, again, in really high doses that we, some enzymes may help with breaking down some of the um, problematic carbohydrates that we see like in legumes that can cause gas. But again, you know, we're looking at things that may be occurring in the mouth um, where, where we, we have a pH of about maybe six. So um, it's it, it because I mean, it, and, and you're right, it is, it's really um, the antithesis of what makes sense physiologically um, and medically and that, you know, individuals who have um, reflux 
you use an, an antacid or um, you know one that's going to reduce um, the production of, of stomach acid, or they may need to go about you know looking into a surgery for uh, um, supporting that that esophageal sphincter because that's part of the reason why we have reflux is that that muscle there has weakened or is not functioning properly and so you get reflux of the gastric juices up um but taking you know digestive enzymes I, that's going to be really just a, a a waste of time and money and um you know if, if you have a better option for treatment go that route yeah. And, you know, when I've talked to people who have tried it, um, there was Dr. Ralph Esposito. He was like one of the first people on the podcast. He had tried it. He said he had never noticed any benefit either. Yeah. I hate to dismiss hundreds of anecdotes, though. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as much as I like to be scientific and have the studies, it, it's hard when you have literally hundreds of people saying, I've had acid reflux for years, maybe like decades, and I took this product and I don't have it anymore. I mean, placebo effect is a real thing, but I mean, that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's a pretty strong anecdote to say after decades, you try the supplement and, it, and all of a sudden things are fine. I mean, why do you think we see that? In most cases, when people change just one thing, they don't change just one thing, mm -hmm. you know? So it perhaps, you know, again, if we just are lacking evidence, maybe the studies weren't done properly um, or they haven't been done yet. Um, you know, perhaps that we're, we, we could be missing something. Um, but in most cases, yeah, it could either be placebo effect or just that they have changed other things as well. Um, perhaps maybe, you know, that they're just not as aware of the things that they changed. Uh, but yeah, in most cases, like when people, you know, change their diet a little bit, they're going to be making more health conscious decisions overall. Uh, just like if we reduce late night snacking, a lot of people will find that they lose weight not necessarily because of the time of day. It's not that it's a late night snacking thing. It's just that that led to a reduction in caloric intake and that's what led to um, weight reduction. So I think it's important that we're not, you know, applying causation where there's a correlation just in terms of, you know, physiologically speaking, um, there are not a lot of mechanisms by which, you know, taking that could really reduce gastric reflux. Um, but, you know, yeah, I don't want to dismiss people. And if it, that's the thing with placebo effect. If it works, it still works. Mm -hmm. Does the mechanism matter as much? I mean, for, for, you know, scientific integrity, I argue yes. But for a person, if they find that that is a worthwhile investment for them and it helps them, and like nothing else has helped them, mm, you know, as long as I think, once again, we're transparent about what could be going on there, it's probably not harmful. I think the harm comes from when we are um, really steadfast and like thinking that that's, that must be what it was. And like, I don't want to, you know, trust like medical practitioners or science that, that might say that it's not that thing. Just, you know, being realistic that maybe it's not the mechanism of, you know, that supplement doing anything. Um, something else is going on in concert with that. But if you feel better, that is obviously super important. Sure. Yeah, of course. Um, and, and I think, one of the other points I wanted to bring up that Dr. Ruscio had talked about, um, I don't know if this is anything you had kind of noted in from the interview, but he talks about fasting a decent amount. Um, and certainly intermittent fasting is, is very popular now. And, you know, face value, it kind of makes sense. Well, if you're not eating, you are resting the gut and all of that. But at the same time, if you're matching calories, you are then just eating that much more later. And there's going to be that much more of a load of food at that later time. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if I've seen any studies showing fasting itself, if the calories were then made up at another time of the day, really had much of an effect on anything or was really beneficial. Um, right. So what do you think in terms of fasting being helpful for GI health? Um, I mean, in terms of, you know, we know that it's, there's no metabolic advantage there. We don't really have data on intermittent fasting specifically in humans. I know that um, one that was popularized was on fruit flies. Uh, if you want to talk about um, discrepancies in microbial contents between a human and a fruit fly, it's really significant. <laughs> um, <laughs> fruit flies are, uh, they, they are only going to be inhabited by aerotolerant bacteria. And so that is like a lot of ours, like what we see in the colon, um, they're, they're, they're anaerobic bacteria. And so we're trying to say like, oh, this fruit fly data tells us what's going on in humans. Absolutely not. Um, but 
I have seen a couple, um, one was a, a pilot study and then there was another, I think one or two works that came out of the same lab. Um, they were actually looking at a, a meal replacement product in individuals with IBD. And in that case, um, fasting mimicking diet. So this was not an intermittent fasting. It was just that some days they were eating a very low calorie diet of about 700 calories a day and others they were a little bit higher, about 1,000 to 1,400 calories per day. Um, and that appeared to reduce um, levels of a specific T cell. And so they, they then said that, you know, that could be potentially a, an indication of reduced inflammatory tone in individuals with inflammatory bowel disease. And they saw a similar reduction in individuals with type 2 diabetes. Um, but again, they were but that really was just similar. a deficit? Like they were in a deficit um, the whole time, it sounds like. It was, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So they call it, so that's why it's fasting. They call it fasting right. mimicking. Um, I'm not sure what their justification is for saying that that mimics fasting because it doesn't. You're not mm -hmm. fasted, you're fed, you're just having a very low calorie diet. Um, and they were really looking at, you know, can, can, can this food replacement product be used during the fasting mimicking diet um, as a way to, you know, reduce, um, I guess, food load in the gut, but still have some nutrients available. Uh, but, you know, overall, like the clinical relevance of that remains to be seen um, because we know that, you know, there's not a metabolic advantage to that, that if calories matched individuals who do intermittent fasting versus individuals who don't will have uh, equal weight loss um, in, in, in circadian rhythm studies on mice. Uh, the, that data, when they were trying to then replicate that in humans, was not replicated in terms of changes to the microbiome. So if you have circadian rhythm disruption in mice, you can see changes in the microbiome. does not appear to happen to the same extent um, in humans. So I don't think that there's evidence yet to show that there's any benefit to um, fasting uh, or even really much benefit to the fasting mimicking diets. And that you know, in individuals who have an inflammatory bowel disease, their risk of nutrient deficiency is going to be much greater, especially if they're having a lot of ex uh, exacerbation. Um, and so I think it's important there that when they can uh, tolerate solid food and especially you know, oral intake, that's extremely beneficial um, for their recovery. So I don't think that it's wise to, you know, without reason, put people on a really very low calorie diet um, or, or you know, tell them that they should be fasting because we don't have the evidence that it's beneficial. Uh, and and it's, it is something that I see, you know, people recommend, but in kind of the same vein as, um, you know, recommending a lot of fermented foods like kombucha and, and fermented right. dairy and things like that. It seems logical. It seems reasonable. Uh, but that, but there's really no evidence to show that it does anything. You know, we, we, the, the, kombu, the funny kombucha systematic review that I posted, it had one study, um, mm -hmm. because there's just no data on humans or, you know, we do have, we do have actually a lot of epidemiological data looking at the influence of fermented dairy, and it just doesn't seem like the effects are, are really that strong. They're just minimal effects, beneficial in some cases, just neutral in others. Um, and so, it, yeah, sure, it could be helpful, but, you know, to say that it is for certain right now, I think is just an overstatement because we don't have, you know, in that case, it's not so much the, the evidence of absence, but it's just the absence of evidence. And so we just have to be more pragmatic about what we're saying. Right. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, I think that applies to a lot of what we know with gut health right now in terms of at least what's put out there is it's just the start of this information. And I think people are just jumping to conclusions a lot. And that's one of the things we talked about before. Um, you know, I do appreciate uh, some, some of these naturopathic doctors. I appreciate what they're trying to do and that they're trying to, you know, look at lifestyle before just prescribing drugs. But I do think there is some excessive extrapola extrapolation from the data you know, where it might not really support the recommendations that they're putting out there. And then mm -hmm. somebody without a scientific background takes that as gospel. And that's when you run into problems. Exactly. Yep. So I, I think I'm going to call you the myth buster for this episode here. <laughs> <laughs> I will gladly wear that title. <laughs> so um, where can people find your stuff? You're on Instagram, anything else? Um, yeah, so Instagram and Facebook as Vitamin PhD. Um, my website is vitaminphdnutrition.com. I do one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching through Renaissance Periodization, and I also do one-on-one -on -one video coaching via my own company, Vitamin PhD Nutrition LLC. Uh, I work with a lot of folks who have, you know, gastrointestinal distress and um, just, you know, seem to struggle sometimes with motivation, sticking to whatever diet they, you know, they, they really want to try, but they just find it hard to do 
um, day to day. I can, uh, I, I'm also, uh, had, have, have contributed to the gut health section of the RP Diet Book 2.0, which is available. Um, I have links for that on my website and links to Stronger Experts where I have more videos, RP Plus, I have even more videos and am also writing a book. So keep your eye out for that um, in the next year. Killing it. Try it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again. Oh, thank you.